Hey, Yara. Hello and good morning, you two. How are you doing today? We are well. How about you? Absolutely fantastic and fascinated by this thing called Bitcoin because I'm, I'm still lost as to what it is and why people will step up to a coin star and go, uh-uh, 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 don't put it on that Bitcoin thing. But yet, God bless Bitcoin is saying there's a positive here, people. So our goal was to help educate people about what is Bitcoin. I learned about it 10 years ago. Wow. And like many people, I thought it was a scam 10 years ago. So what we've done is taken 10 years of knowledge and try to compact it into 89 minutes. And it's it's for education. It's just to help people you know, learn about this new technology called Bitcoin. I think my biggest weakness, guys, is the fact that my financial advisor told me about five to 10 years ago, do not even think about going there. We are not going there. It's about your future. And I need programs like God Bless Bitcoin to really put me in a place of mind and in my heart that, hey, it's not as bad as what you think. Yeah, so I was a former financial advisor for over 20 <laughs> years. And what, what, what I learned is that that system's a little bit rigged. So your financial advisor is only allowed to show you investments mm -hmm. that the government approves of. So there's an overriding agency called FINRA, and FINRA restricts advisors on what they could show their clients. And for whatever reason, the government doesn't want you to know about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's changing. So I've met with a lot of other financial advisors and the top, you know, um, investment firms, and they're 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 changing their tune. For example, Fidelity, BlackRock, Morgan Stanley. These are huge investment firms that are now allowing their clients to invest in Bitcoin. Mm. So even at Charles Schwab. So that that is tr changing. But you're right. Five to ten years ago, the financial advisors were restricted from allowing you to talk about it. And a lot of the firms are still restricting their clients. Wow. Kelly, I've got a big question for you. When it comes to the world of religion and churches accepting Bitcoin, what I don't understand is how do you tithe with Bitcoins? So, I mean, I, I, that, maybe we can educate people at that level as well, because there are a lot of us that do tithe every single week. We make sure that we do that. But how does it get to the church and how does the church use it with their outreach? Well, I think that that answer is probably going to be church dependent. Every church will set up their own system to accept donations. And if the church has Bitcoin, you can, of course, donate in Bitcoin. But honestly, within the United States right now, Bitcoin is not a form of currency as right. much as it is a, a value. We're using it as a savings account, not a checking account. So um, right now, as a Bitcoiner myself, I would say, hold on to it use your dollars to donate like you know use your dollars as your checkbook use your bitcoins as your saving account that is so wise because you know what where where's my emergency accounts where am i saving my money at in a bank and i could be doing it it with bitcoin right yeah the problem with keeping your money in dollars is that the government prints more and more dollars each yeah. year and it their purchasing power like in the movie we have father sirico talking about it's like diluting the wine with water. And in the Bible, it says that's an abomination to the Lord. And the government does that all day long. They're diluting our money by printing more money. So for example, if you had a thousand dollars in your checking account four years ago or six years ago, it only buys you $520 worth of goods and services today. Are banks in favor of Bitcoin? Some banks are, but most of them aren't. And the reason is that it disrupts their business model. Yep. So just like when we went from voice phone calls to voice over internet protocol phone calls, the long distance companies went out of business. And just like we went from film to digital photos, you know, Kodak lost a lot of their revenue. The banks are gonna lose a lot of their revenue when we use blockchain technology to do financial transactions. So they're, they're really scared of that. I actually have a friend that told me, he says, you need to understand Bitcoin because it's like the metric system. When you understand the metric system, you'll find it's a greater system. Do you see the same thing being equal? Yeah, so for 3,500 years, we used gold and silver as our money. Yep. And in 1971, the U.S. went off the gold standard and all the other countries went off the gold standard after, the, after that. So our money is broken. And what Bitcoin is, it's a digital version of gold 
It's the best money humans have ever created. And as people recognize that, we will just naturally default back into a hard money system. And it's my opinion that that new hard money system will be Bitcoin. So it's just it's, it's just education is, is, you know, once you learn this is the best form of money humans created, you just will use that as money. We got to get listeners to understand that they can easily access this by going to GodBlessBitcoin.com. I mean, you guys have set out to do something here that why hasn't anybody else or are they trying and we're just ignoring? I don't know if anybody else has decided to try to do this, but when we looked around over the past few years at how much people are struggling, I'm in a grocery store and watching a mom tell her kids, no, we can't afford that this week. Put yep. that back. Go yep. find the generic brand. We knew some, and I work in the communities that live at the poverty level, and I see them blaming themselves all the time. Like, what am I doing wrong? Well, that bothers me. You're not doing anything wrong. It's the financial system that you have inherited that is doing you wrong. So when our governments continue to print money and dilute our purchasing power, they're stealing right out of our pockets. That's what's wrong, not you. So I don't know if other people are seeing that or if it was just we happened to be in the right place at the right time. But it was important to us, especially for me as a teacher, to get that message out and educate people. Yeah, we just want to let people know you have an option. You could opt out of the system. Whoa. You know, it's you know, it's a peaceful revolution. There is another system, and all we want to do is just educate people about this new system. Wow. The middle class and the poor. I work at a grocery store. I know how many EBT cards I see every single day. How can I, on my level of play, help these middle class and poor people learn that there is a newer way to walk? Well, I think it's what in the Bitcoin community we call orange pilling someone. <laughs> when you when you explain to somebody that there is another system out there that allows them to create a store of value, i.e. a savings a savings for themselves that isn't diluted, you're opening their eyes. Send them to our movie, share. Yeah. We have the goal of a billion views, Arrow, so that we can show as many people as possible that Bitcoin is hope and it gives them the possibility of creating a store of value for themselves. So I think just talking about it and being willing to share what you know, you know, it takes one person and then another person and you pass it on and pass it forward and that's how it happens. And it, and it doesn't take a lot to get involved. You know, the smallest unit of a Bitcoin is called a Satoshi. There's 100 million Satoshis for every one Bitcoin. Hmm. So, and it takes 15 Satoshis to equal a penny. So like, you know, what, what our, you know, family does is, you know, if they get an extra $5 in their Venmo account, they add $5 to their Bitcoin in Venmo. Oh. You know, so instead of going to Starbucks and sending three bucks, you make your tea or your coffee at home and put the extra $3 into savings. And you do that a little bit at a time for many years, and all of a sudden you got a, a nice savings account there. Wow. God bless the two of you for doing this, for taking that step. It's called God Bless Bitcoin. You can get it at GodBlessBitcoin.com. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank, Thank you, Arrow. you, Arrow. Be brilliant today, okay? You hey, too. You, you too. <laughs> How are you doing today? Hey, Scott. How are you doing? I'm well. Fantastic. Fantastic. So wh where do they have you placed on the planet today, sir? I am in Regalsville, Pennsylvania, Bucks County. Very cool. Hey, I got to tell you something. This this book is so important to our present place of music because I, I was just reading up on a study that one of the majority listeners of classic rock radio stations today are the young adults, the Gen Zers. And they don't have that leadership role of knowing the real story until we get books like this. Yeah, right. Well, I'm, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> what what drew you to this book? Because, I mean, this I was horrified when we lost Casey Kasem and Dick Clark. They were my storytellers as a kid. But it's you, Scott, that steps forward to make this happen. I mean, I've always loved, uh, you know, music of that era, you know, the 1960s particularly. But I mean, I love every, I mean, I love post-war pop music, you know, from 50s R&B uh, you know, through the 60s, uh, all the British invasion, uh, uh, the folk rock music like the Mamas and the Papas, you know, uh, uh, doo-wop, uh, 70s singer-songwriter. So it's just, you know, and I, I enjoy storytelling. 
you know? So uh, it was just an incredible mix of the two. Well, I'm a firm believer that your last book, All the Leaves Are Brown, about the mamas and papas, is is a very big reason why so many people are being drawn to that. Because I just recently had a conversation with Mama Cass's daughter. And, I, and all the way through that interview, I kept going, do you know about Scott? Have you read this book? <laughs> yeah. I, well, yeah, she just put that out a couple uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it, I, I haven't had a chance to read it because I'm I'm writing my own book, uh, another book right now. But, um, you know, I know it's, it's interesting to hear the perspective. I, I, I know she talks a lot about um, the, the fallout from from her the death of her mother within her own family, which to me, that sounds incredibly interesting. You know, I'm sure it, uh, it resonated. It probably still does. The impact of like a rolling stone. It was such an interesting time in music history. And here came this guy who had kind of a strange sounding voice, but he knew how to share a story. He sure did. I mean, he was an incredible songwriter, had developed into one, you know, as a, in his early 20s, uh, was, uh, you know, a star of the folk circuit, the folk uh, boom movement that the, you know, the Mamas and the Papas were all a part of and so many other uh, later stars, uh, you know, of pop music. And, um, you know, it just he just took that next logical step to rock and roll. He had grown up as a rock and roll fan, you know, of the, of the first generation of rock and roll and decided it was time for him to enter into that fo- uh, forum. And, uh, you know, like a Rolling Stone, it was off his second electric album. And it just uh, it just catapulted him into the stratosphere. How do you define the word folk artist in the way that I think that I've, for the longest time I've been telling people that I think that we're in another one of those folk rock movements with with people like Taylor Swift and even Ed Sheeran. They're storytellers, but do they qualify as being a folk artist? Uh, you know, I think they are. Uh, you know, descendants of you know what people like uh, Bob Dylan and and so many others mm-hmm. uh, from that era became. But but Dylan was focused on just old timey folk music from Appalachia to the, the, the South. And, you know, it was a, it was a mix of blues and, and, and folk artists like Woody Guthrie and um, just, you know, sharing uh, stories of life coming up through hard times, through depression. So I wouldn't say it's the same thing, but it's, it's for sure an offspring of that. I I was shocked to learn that this song was six minutes and seven seconds. I mean, how did AM radio even put up with that? Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, they they had high hopes for that song going into that session. Uh, When I say they, I mean, Bob Dylan and his producer, Tom Wilson, and and even Columbia Records. But it was it was six minutes. And then they they tried doing it faster, singing it Mm. faster uh, and bringing it down into the three minute mark, something a little bit more releasable. But it just took away from the song. So. You know, uh, this guy, uh, a young guy named, um, I forget his name, but he was a, uh, he was a, like a promotions man at Columbia and he found a discarded uh, uh, acetate in the garbage uh, of the song and he took it to this local club. It was a celebrity club that was run by one of Richard uh, Burton's ex-wives named Sybil. And he just had the DJ there play it. And it got such a rousing response from them. And uh, you know, they played it until the acetate wore out because they weren't designed to go for a long time. Right. And um, th- in the audience that night were a couple of AM DJs from two big New York stations. And they, they called up uh, Columbia, one of the promotional singles, and they started playing it on their stations. And it was, uh, you know, only a couple of weeks later, uh, Columbia decided to go ahead and press the single. And, and you know, within a month, it's in the top uh, 100. See, and listeners need to know, this was pre-FM radio. I mean, because, I mean, FM didn't really start to materialize until the 70s. No, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, you, you had FM, but it was, you know, it, it was, was not, not <laughs> no, yeah, it was nothing like we know now. <laughs> you know, it, it was almost kind of like uh, experimental stations for, for the big AM stations. I know Dan Ingram was a big top 40 jock on uh, WABC in, in the 60s in new york and he had a show on wc's fm channel where he could play jazz music on the on the weekends and i, I you know wnew had the first all-female uh, talk radio uh channel on the uh station on the um, uh, fm radio that had sally jesse Raphael. so oh i think it was uh, it was uh, very experimental and you know in the in the late 60s and early 70s it kind of became uh, you know the the premier spot for uh, for for cutting edge music. Yeah, because I was I was at a radio station in Billings, Montana, back in the seventies. At that was a daytime station. We used that FM station to further our our music beyond that date. Because once that tower had to come down and shut off, we went to our FM tower so that we could stay on. 
Yeah, right. Yeah, there's there's limited range at night for FM. I don't know why, but uh, you probably know better than I do. But <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's like okay, time to power down and go over to to FM. Yeah, the greatest thing about this book is that you give us that image of Bob Dylan before the fame sets in, and that to me is what's missing from a lot of this. I mean, it's the same thing with the John Denver story. We know him for the hits, but I want to know the misses or the things that happened before people started, you know, falling in love with them. Yeah, that's that's always my interest. That's you know the the starving artist period is always kind of more fascinating to me because that's really what makes uh, you know a, a, an artist. It's kind of like right now I'm writing a book on Waylon Jennings that focuses on his uh, first 15 years of his professional career where he really struggled. You know, he was a, a superstar in the 70s, but uh, from the late 50s to, throughout through the 60s, he uh, he struggled a bit. You know, and that, that to me, that is the makeup of an artist that resolve and, you know, the, it, it comes out later on uh, when they become the uh, stars. Are you going to talk to his son? Because he is an incredible conversation. I have reached out to him. So and I, I know his manager. So I'm hoping to hear back from him uh, soon. Oh, my God. Because, I mean, it, to me, that's part of the journey as well. What happens after the legend, you know, is, is there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, how do they handle uh, the, the fall off? And, uh, you know, every every artist who has had success has experienced that, especially even 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 the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And they, they had their lulls. Did you find it interesting to tap into how people assume they knew Bob Dylan with a song like like a Rolling Stone? It's almost like people said, yeah, that's Bob. That's Bob. I'm following Bob. But they didn't know Jack about Bob. No, that's uh, that's always the case, and I know you know. Seeing uh, many interviews with Bob Dylan, I know that you know, things like that kind of get on his nerves, and it's understandable. But it's you know, it's part of the part of the game. I mean, most people don't pay attention; they just they just see what's in front of them. They don't do the digging. Uh, they don't do the research uh, or, uh, or or study the back catalog. You know, so they're they're just kind of in the here and the now and on to the next thing. So I think when you go into entertainment, you gotta you gotta kind of accept that. I've got a new podcast that, that t- talks about all the crazy things our parents told us. And one of them, the focus before this conversation was about how a Rolling Stone gathers no moss. And, and right away, when, when I started doing the research for Like a Rolling Stone, I'm going, well, this is a Rolling Stone as well. It did not gather moss, but it gathered fans. It sure did. And it, I think it continues to do that. Yes. I mean, it's a huge, hugely influential song. It's just one of those songs when it comes on the radio, man, that just, you know, I don't turn it off. It's it, it, my toe is tapping, you know, and I'm singing along to those crazy lyrics, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, and we and we can all probably just sing it almost as good as Bob. <laughs> yeah. Would you say that Bob Dylan was one of the first when it came to being a mystique, a mystery. People didn't know enough because I feel like that Led Zeppelin had to get it from somewhere, but I, it had to start, and I believe from Bob Dylan. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he wasn't, uh, you know, he he wasn't out doing uh, commercials or jingles or, you know, I, I know you know he was supposed to go on Ed Sullivan, but when they told him he couldn't sing the song he wanted to sing, he walked off. You know, that was that was out of the ordinary uh, for a lot of. Uh, a lot of the singers uh, in that day, because they are always very amenable to uh, to working with those kind of people, because they were the, that those were the people who promoted your uh, your record and helped you sell a million copies. So, uh, I think Bob was a very genuine kind of guy, and he was. I'm sure there was a part of him that was happy to sell a million copies and make <laughs> millions of dollars, and uh, you know. But I'm sure there's also part of him, probably more than the average star, it was just okay to walk away from it because i know he almost did even before like he recorded like a rolling stone yeah yeah I, well, you're you're going to be the one that's going to know this answer because i sure can't find it did he ever at any time play that electric guitar with this song or was it always the acoustic you know what i don't know the answer to that question uh but you know i you know i, I have seen any footage of him uh performing it uh in the in the mid '60s in England, at the tour where half the audience is booing him, you know that was the <laughs> focus of of uh, Martin Scorsese's documentary, and he did have an electric guitar strapped on, so <laughs> I, probably so. So, were you disappointed like I was when Bob sold his catalog? I thought I don't want other people to have this; it belongs to Bob. Nah, there's yeah, there's really not much you can do. The way music is going, I mean, they're all doing it. Like Springsteen sold. I yeah. think Springsteen's. I don't think he sold his whole thing. I think he sold half interest. You know, David Crosby did it before he passed away. I think Neil Young did it. So, you know, these guys got to make money, man. They got people to feed. <laughs> so, but you know, and and in some ways, I'm kind of because like 
so with Bob, Bob puts out a, a lot of a lot of archival stuff, mm-hmm. and, and some others don't. And you'd like to see some of that, you know. So it, it, for some, it's probably a good thing. For others, maybe not so much. Wow. Where can people go to find out more about the book as well as you and follow you with this Waylon Jennings project? Uh, they can go to my uh, auth- uh, website. It's uh, scottsheaauthor.com, and Shea is spelled S-H-E-A, and it'll link you to all my socials and can give you updates, and uh, you can comment on some of the things I post. Dude, you've got to come back to this show. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. Absolutely. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be pitching you. <laughs> Will you be brilliant today, okay? Thanks, Harry. You too. Bye. Hello and good morning. Good morning. It's Dr. Bernie Mullen. Doctor, how are you doing today? I'm fine and dandy. This is Otto. Arrow, as in bow and arrow? Oh, Arrow. It, I, type to me is Otto. <laughs> <laughs> Automatic. <laughs> well, nice to meet you, Arrow. Man, I'll tell you what. I'm really excited to talk with you because, I mean, what we're needing right now on this planet and in this nation are teachers like yourself in the way of opening up our eyes with real down-to-earth conversations about basically recovery and to replenish what it is that we have. Yes, indeed. So true. For you to be in this moment, when did you hear it in your heart to say, it's it's time, I'm, I'm getting called to do this book now? Um, probably about five years ago. Really? Uh, because I, I hate politics. <laughs> you know, I really do. I was never been political, but you know, as the book outlines is, you know, it, it follows my career as an American dream, trying to achieve the American dream. And obviously I was blessed to very much succeed um you know my eyes started to open up became much more aware of you know social consciousness joined boards found different groups that needed help and support and you know started uh, looking more and more at politics and realizing uh, boy we're really missing the mark mm-hmm. one of the things that i've been asking a lot of especially before the covid lockdown was what is the american dream because the only thing that i keep seeing are people dumping money into that darn lottery yeah, well, you know, I mean, the, the the old joke is the lottery is the stock market for poor people. Yep. And, you know, whether you play or you don't, you got about the same chance of winning, slim and nothing. Um, you know, the, the American dream really in its inception back in the 30s, you know, was somewhat materialistic. It was a home. You know, for me, the American dream was being in charge of my own destiny and having the opportunity. I grew up in income subsidized housing, council housing, as we called it in Liverpool, England, uh, where I grew up, you know, and came here as an immigrant at age 24. And, um, you know, it was, I want a better life for me and for my kids and my grandkids. And uh, this country has, has given me that. So the the number one genesis for writing the book was, wow, thank you, America. Really appreciate you adopting me, letting me in, giving me this opportunity. Uh, And thank you to all the people who were the wonderful Americans who, you know, befriended my ex-wife and I, who was mother of my three kids, was from England. So that's where it started. This is every bit the reason why I'm in love with immigration. And I welcome immigration because I learn so much from other people who've been to other places. And if we would just open up our eyes and heart and just listen, I think we could become stronger. Well, I think so, too. I mean, we are a country of immigrants. Yes. Uh, You know, that's our strength. You know, we wouldn't have pizza pie. We wouldn't have Mexican (laughs) food. We wouldn't have, you know, I mean, we love all this food and we love all this culture and we love pinatas and we love all that these different nationalities are brought to this country. Why don't we like each other? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, So when you start off with, we are a nation of immigrants with the strength. I mean, weak people didn't get on a boat, you know, and come from Italy um, to the United States not speaking any English. It was the strong people. It was the people who, you know, were suppressed, whether it was religious, political suppression, economic suppression. They were the tough ones, the fighters, the got in the, you know, the prairie screwness, the wagons, and came across, you know, the country and through the Rocky Mountains, where I'm talking to you from now. I wow. mean, these were, that's that's the beauty, and that's the strength. And today, we need, you know, we need a strong immigration policy that says there are people of special merit and ability, aliens of special merit and ability, as it was called, when I got my uh, labor certification back in the late 70s. 
to come and, and live here permanently, um, you know, and then we need people to do the, the menial work as well, the service workers, whether it's the agronomists, you know, out in the fields of California for all of our fruit and veggies, or whether it's people who are cleaning the hotel rooms or providing the coffee as baristas, you know, I mean, that's where most of the immigrants work and same in England, you know, same in countries across Europe. Um, why wouldn't we embrace these people right. who want to work oh, i mean i you. you know I, I live in denver colorado and i go on colorado boulevard a block and a half from my house in a car pull up at the traffic lights at leedsdale road and there are four or five venezuelan crews cleaning windshields and you just have to wave and say you know non gracias you know and they smile back at you they yeah. want to work <laughs> and we've do, let them do. we've let them in with immigration dates in 2026 and no work permits Mm. How much? How much sense does that make? Mm, mm, mm. They're they're automatically non-documented, and quote illegal. Not that I believe any human being can be illegal, but they're illegal to work. It makes no sense. Yeah, I've, I I have uh, friends that that will tell me because I say, why don't you work here? Please send in an application. They go, I can't. I can't. And, and and then they explain to me why. And it's such a deep hidden secret to them. And I just and to me, that's part of the conversation. Tell me why you can't and I will help you get your can. Yeah, well, I I uh, I went to work as a professor 10 years at the University of Massachusetts. When I first applied for my permanent residency, um, the University of Massachusetts screwed up a couple of times, delayed the process. Department of Labor in the state of Massachusetts deliberately turned me down. Um, and had to get Ted Kennedy, the president of the University of Massachusetts system, got Ted Kennedy to call the Department of Labor and say, stop, stop screwing around, give him the labor permit. I got the labor permit as an um, uh, alien of merit and distinguished ability because I was the only one that had a PhD in business and had played or coached pro soccer or college soccer and had played semi-pro soccer, oh. coached uh, college soccer, had a PhD in business. Nobody else had a PhD in business, so I got it. I apply to INS, and by the time I get the uh, approval of INS, the guy goes, oh, my God, your uh, I-9 expired before you applied the no. paperwork into INS. We have to deport you. You've got seven days for you, your English wife, and your three American kids to leave the country. Wow. And, and here we are screwing around, letting millions of people in every year without properly, properly you know, uh, uh, vetting their applications before they come to this country. It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to mention any political figure names, but something a couple of days ago really injured my soul when, when it came forward saying even those that are born in this country will be, de you know, deported. Just you're gone. Oh, yeah, the and, dreamers. Yeah, yeah, the young, yeah, the young kid. Well, I mean, they can't be gone because uh, that's illegal. There is birthright. All my three yeah. kids are are English and uh, American, and rightfully so. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, uh, and it's just one of one of many things. But I think Arrow, you know, what I've found is the uh, American dream was incredibly aspirational for me personally, um, you know, and for my family. And so that's what I want to bring back. It's an amazing, uniting force, bringing everybody together, which is something that we need to do. Um, but it hasn't been available for all. And the, you know, so what we did in the book, uh, the book chronicles my journey from state to state as I move around in sports. So starting at the graduate school at the University of Kansas, 10 years as a professor at UMass, then going to Pittsburgh with the Pirates, then Denver with the Colorado Rockies and with the minor league hockey team and then vice chancellor of athletics, the University of Denver, New York to go work for David Stern as uh, chief marketing officer of the NBA and building the team business function, Atlanta to be the CEO of the Atlanta Hawks and the Thrashers that was an NHL team at the time and uh, and then building my own business and so it chronicles that and and my success and and the fights and the book is about hard work it's not about giving anybody anything it's a hand up not a handout um, and then it goes into the top 10 social issues in America right now as identified by Pew Research, the things that people are voting on, and it goes into depth in all 10, but the top two, number one is no surprise, what is it they say, the income stupid, it's the income gap. Um, how, do we, how do we solve 
America has 37 million people living in poverty. 37 million. Yeah. One of the highest in the world and the greatest country on the world is measured by GDP. Our GDP, you know, China caught up for a while, but they're a little better than half our GDP. We've got to stop that. Yeah. So the solution is a national minimum wage. Yes, it's paid for by businesses. In my own personal company, we had over 200 employees, and we did it. You know, it's not easy, but, um, you know, the University of Denver um, athletic program, we sell all their tickets, do their donations, and we had eight kids there, and we raised their pay from 22, 24,000 starting, and now they make 34,000, <laughs> the Denver city and county minimum wage. And it works, you know, plus plus they get um, commission on top of that. Yeah. So business people need to step up. Why? What does that do? It takes a single parent female with a preschool child, allows her to work one job with dignity, be home to cook dinner for that child, and then cuddle that child and teach them how to read and write. Mm, mm. And, and that's the segue. So number one, do that. Number two, um, give them free health care. Give them free, so the education piece is free preschool for every kid in America. That saves every family ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year. All of a sudden, you got a single parent female is making forty five thousand dollars a year de facto because she's not paying for a preschool. Yep. And that child is getting a quality education and likely to go into kindergarten able to read and write and do basic math. Wow. It's massive massive so that that's number one number two free uh, latchkey kid babysitting in school one in five american kids right now are uh getting uh are at home alone post school uh in in preschool and grade school it's not doesn't work it's only a petri dish for all kinds of problems later in life mm -hmm. and then then the program really kicks in we're recommending that there's an eight-week boot camp for every rising freshman. They go away, they sleep away, black, brown, yellow, rich, poor, doesn't matter. They're in a camp. They learn how to be an adult. They yes. get up early in the morning and exercise. Yes. And every other day they cook a meal. They come away with eight recipes for a healthy breakfast, lunch, and dinner to take back to many of their parents who grew up in a food desert who think it's Domino's Monday, yeah. McDonald's Tuesday, and out of a can Wednesday. We turn that around. We teach them how to get along and live with one another. And we teach them that it's not about them. It's about other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a teaching about building a community and making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. uh, then before sophomore, junior, and senior year, they do an internship. They get paid all four years. They would be paid $18,000 at the current rate. Uh, we'll get banks to compete to give them 7.5% interest <laughs> if they leave money in their bank accounts. They'll have no tax, Social Security, or any of the deductions. An 18-year-old kid living in an inner-city marginal home could have $25,000 cash at age 18. To create a marginal, uh, to create their own entrepreneurial business, or to buy an apartment, wow. generational wealth in half a generation. Wow! I got to ask you a personal question here. In the way that we started out talking about how we don't like politics, and yet this book is going to inspire, influence, and empower politicians to start making this their journey. I mean, do you fear that somebody's going to steal from this incredible story that you've got? Oh, I don't fear. I hope. Oh. <laughs> That's what I want. That's what I want. You know, I good, good ideas have plenty of fathers. They're not orphans, <laughs> you know, and it's I, I, I need that's what I need more than anything else. Our, what I need on, you know, from this uh, broadcast from you is find a listener who's a politician. Let's adopt it as their manifesto. I've started in Colorado. I've got an amazing senator pro tem of the Colorado State Senate. James Coleman, who's getting behind it, who's a wonderful young man in one of the toughest financial districts here in Denver, Colorado. That's what we need. You know, we need we need the politicians to adopt it. And then and then two other quick points on the book. One is the recommendation that everybody leads their life like a, a four legged stool, mm -hmm. um, that you have four legs to stand on. So when one is wobbly, the other three hold you up. And those four legs are one, a value system. For those who are religious, it's their religious values. For those who are just strong values, it's their values. And the value is, it's about 
others, not me. It's not me centered. And it comes from the Dalai Lama and uh, Desmond Tutu's book of joy. And it's, you know, they were interviewed for a week by an American journalist and they concluded the happiest people in the world are people who are other centered, not self centered. Number two, it's family. And it's uh, Greg Schiano, the football coach at Rutgers, one of my clients. Um, family, f.a.m.a.l.y. Forget about me. I love you. So I am the patriarch of my 16 people in my family, my kids, my grandkids, my kids' uh, partners. Um, that's my job is to make sure they live the American dream and they stay within their values. Number three, a career. A Ideally, a vocation, what you love to do, uh, working for a company, and that's today's young generation. What do they want? It's a good product and service at a fair market price that makes the world a better place. Uh, and that, that it is a good place to work where they listen, where they uh, uh, Im- input and execute their ideas. And they are a strong community citizen, making the community a better place. And then finally, the fourth leg is community. What have I done for my community, people around me on a daily basis? So four-legged stool. And then the the final book really goes where you started, Arrow, and that is, how do we we change America? Um, And I was on vacation in Costa Rica uh, 18 months ago. And there, you know, in, in Mexico, you say, muchas gracias, they'll say de nada, you know, don't think anything of it, it's nothing, you're welcome. Um, but in Costa Rica, they say pura vida, pure life, have a pure life. Wow. It's a national ethos. We need a national ethos back in America, and I'm recommending PAL. So, Arrow, you're now my PAL, I am your PAL. <laughs> and PAL stands for peace and love I love that we it. greet we greet each other as a pal we're all pals we're all brothers and sisters as americans let's start acting like it oh i love where your heart is you've got to come back to this show more often i just love where you are and we can help teach where we can grow to i i would i would love to do it it's you know it's simple it's simple it's not about me it's about you. It's this country. You know, it's, people have said to me, well, it sounds like socialism. And I'm like, well, first of all, you don't understand what socialism is. <laughs> and most Americans don't. But, you know, uh, by the way, I was, I've was i made my career in sports. Yep. I've been CEO of Major League Teams, first immigrant to do it. And what is the most socialistic, communistic league in the world? The NFL. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every revenue is shared, including home ticket revenue. They're all shared, all the TV money, merchandise money, one over N. Everybody gets the same, okay? Most brilliant. You know, the only league to rival it in the world is the English Premier League Soccer League, yeah, right? Yeah. Brilliant, brilliantly done. The most capitalist country on earth. We have the most communistic, socialistic uh, sports league in the world and the most successful. What does that tell you? <laughs> We're only as good as our weakest link, so let's push from the bottom up. We will get rid of crime, teenage pregnancy. And by the way, in the book, it outlines all this stuff is costed. It's costed out. And what I'm recommending with all that educational program, it costs less or sorry, it costs about the same as we just gave in the money to Gaza, Israel and to Ukraine. Wow. Why wouldn't we invest in our youth to the same level? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. You've got to come back to this show. Please be brilliant. Well, thank you. No, I really appreciate it. Appreciate you giving the exposure and the megaphone. You know, people, please, um, you know, the book's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and uh, Kobo. All proceeds from the book and all from my management consulting goes to the Aspire Difference Foundation. The uh, foundation funds single parents with preschool kids uh, and four elements. One, the mental health of the caregiver first, stable, secure home, ideally not in the hood. Second, so the kid can go out in the street and play and not be recruited by gangs. Hmm. Third, healthy lifestyle, exercise, healthy food, you know, read, write. Number four, go get a good preschool because you want to get uh, more minorities being in the leadership, being running for politics, uh, being CEOs, being multi-billionaires. It starts with preschool. Yep. 
Yep, yep. Wow. Well, thanks for being my pal today, sir. You're very welcome. Thank you for being my pal and spreading the message. We're all pals. Peace and love. Absolutely. God bless you. Same to you. Bye-bye. Hello and good morning. Hello, is this Arrow? That would be me. Hi, Arrow. This is Mark. Mark, how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm excited to be on the show. Thank you so much. Well, you, you're, you're covering something here that I just totally believe in, and I've been a big fan of faith-based movies, but it takes people like yourself to take it to a quality level that where everybody, it's it's not about questioning, it's about experiencing. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Really kind. Thank you so much. I've heard rumors you're down there in Charleston right now. I am. I'm in uh, I'm in the low country. Yes. Oh, my God. That, that's my soul city. That That is the place where I, I, I want to take my journey with God. I, it really is. Oh, yeah. Well, the holy city, they call it. Yeah, it's it's great. You know, yeah, I got family here. We moved here almost two years ago um, with my wife and her family's here. And we love it. It's really beautiful. So when I thought this movie came to being and you're down there in the Charleston area, were you walking on Folly Beach? Were you over there by the lighthouse? Where did it come to you where you go, I'm answering this call. I've got to do it. Oh, you know what? I actually, uh, I shot the movie in Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago. And really? so, yeah, yeah, the idea came to me when I was, when I was there. Yeah. So, um, I was, uh, it took a while. It's a couple of different ideas kind of came, came together. Um, but, um, but it wasn't one, one exact moment. The main moment was when I put two ideas together. I had an idea about a guy test, uh, uh, to buy an angel, save his hometown. And then an idea about a guy who had a cameraman obsessed with the idea of a cameraman always following him. I put it together. It's like angel and demon. There it is. There's the story. Um, yeah, yeah. So basically making a movie is working on God's time. You know how God takes his time. Well, making a movie takes its time. That's right. It does. It does. You got a lot of patience. You got a lot of patience with filmmaking. I love the way that you did the, the title of the movie for profit. And we're talking about P R O P H E T. That really, that's an eye catcher. Yeah. Yeah. When I had that title, um, I knew right away that that was, that was it. Um, because yeah, it's, it's got the play on words. There's a little bit of the humor to it, but it is also something where, you know, prophecy and, um, and, you know, spirituality and, and faith and all these things, you know, it, it, you, you don't, you don't always, um, come to it from, uh, from, a, a place of words. I mean, we talk about scripture and stuff like that, but a lot of people, you know, really talk about talk and talk and talk about their faith. But when you get into actual prophecy and everything at that, you know, the words are so important and, you know, and, and that's the big thing in the, in the film too, is just how important language is and how important words are and the word. Um, and when it comes to prophecy and, and things like that, you know, what has been foretold and what people are writing about and what people are, the stories people are telling are, are so important. And, um, the only problem with the title is that they have to explain it I'm tired, you know, <laughs> because people are like for, for profit. Oh, with it, with an F. Nope. <laughs> Not with an F. <laughs> Speaking of the laughing part of it. I mean, that's one thing that you give us as viewers to do. You give us per a permission to, to share a laugh, to get into the laugh and to, and to get more deeper into the story. Yeah. Comedy is where I come from. That's where I cut my teeth. So I did about 10 years of comedy right out of, uh, I, I went to UCLA film school and got into a sketch comedy group there. And so for about 10 years of my professional career, I was doing mainly narrative comedy. And then I was called, yeah, I felt really called to, to be in the faith world and, to, but to bring the skills that I worked on there that, that God gave me and, 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 and bring that humor and that lightheartedness to the faith world, which, you know, we definitely have a lot of great, drama a lot of great inspirational moments in the film and it's very much so a a deeply faith film but the lightheartedness in brings people to it i think you know when when you have such heavy heavy subjects and heavy drama in a lot of these faith films certainly you know having a cry fest is is really good but being able to laugh and cry at the same time i think that's how people can really really come to spirit because you know it's one of those things where um I, I, for instance, when I, when I'm looking at pastors, I, I, I follow the pastor and I listen to the pastor that makes me laugh yeah. as well yeah. as think, 
you know, and it's, it's, it's the, it's the pastors and it's the preachers and it's the movies that don't have that lightheartedness that I question sometimes. I'm like, well, we're, you know, joy's in our hearts too. God put joy in our hearts mm-hmm. too. Let's, let's also not just revel in the, you know, let's not just uh, st- focus on the pain and the agony and, and the, the hardships, but let's also remember to laugh and, and to, to bring joy into the hearts, you know? See, that's every bit the reason why I've been a part of Elevation Church and Pastor Stephen Furtick since 2010 is because we do get to laugh. We get to sing. We get, we get to learn. We get to do so many different things. And that's why it's so important for people like yourself to say, hey, look, we can do the same thing in a movie. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you're with people like at church or in a movie theater or with your family at a movie night at home, you know, yeah, being able to laugh with people you care care about and being able to to worship and and bring joy and yeah, sing and and all these things, you know, the full spectrum of emotions is what God gave us and we need to understand that and we need to understand that, you know, laughter is a great, wondrous gift and um and being able to to partake in that is is um special and and that's something that I feel called by God to to bring to the faith world is is um is humor one of the things that the movie does and it's so relatable because i think if we don't um, admit that it's happening to us or there's people around us that are going through it the demon the demon latches onto us and then the angel visits we i wish people would talk more about their their openness and and how they got through their storms and struggles yeah yeah no i feel that for sure and and i put it all in there in the yeah. in the movie i mean i've definitely battled my demons and and desperately tried to listen to my angels it's it, you know i'm not you know i struggle every day uh, every single day with my faith and i think that's you know in in that struggle is where i find the most uh grace from god and 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 one of the things also you know like like you said i i think um I think there's a lot of people out there who think that in order to be a spiritual person or a man of God or things like that, you, you just have an angel. You just need to listen to Jesus. You just need to go to the scriptures. You no, you need to battle the enemy too. And, and it's the darkness that comes every single day that creeps in every single day that you have to be attuned to and really be aware of what those voices are. And, um, and the film, yeah, you know, like the demons, starts out in the film just as this kind of weird cameraman that's always following him with this this little video camera and just annoying and you know and and that's how the enemy starts is it's just like oh it's not that big of a deal oh it's just being annoying a little bit oh kind of funny actually and oh he says mean things but that's all that's all right that's funny and you know but but slowly but surely it's that slippery soap of of sin and you know you start to to think that that voice is is you or that voice is part of you or that voice is is true <laughs> worst case scenario that that those that demon voice is actually true but but no it's not it's it is not at all and and that's why you have to listen to the to the angel voices it's such a difficult task every everybody on this planet has the human condition of angel and demon on the shoulder and it's a difficult difficult life and and, and nobody told us any different and that's what Christ teaches, but it's one of those things where you got to recognize the demon and the angel in order to to really thrive in this life. We're in this generation right now where it seems like, and I, I've talked with more actors about this, in the fact that when they did a faith-based movie, then what happened is, is that then 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 Hollywood ignored them. And it's like, no, you got to reach mm-hmm. beyond. And so it takes people like yourself with a movie like this to say, look, we can still grow together. Because, I mean, I was shocked the other day when I was talking with uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. with his faith-based movie. And it's, and it's like, I love it that everybody is saying, yes, I am part of this this outreach and it's that's maybe that's what we need more of be proud of the outreach yeah absolutely no it it took me a minute to to really embrace coming into the faith market too i mean one of the the issues is that well for me was that i i'm a true filmmaker you know the last 20 years i've been making movies and and i started when i was a teenager and you know when it comes to I really care about filmmaking. I really care about cinema and storytelling and narrative and production value and cinematography. These things matter to me. Storytelling is very, very important to me. And so when I was tasked to jump into the faith world, I hesitated. I was a little afraid because yeah, there's a lot of lower production value films. There's a lot of films that don't have good stories that have great messages, great themes, 
but the acting is subpar or whatever, whatever it is. And so I, I was a little, I was like, Hey God, you know, I, I'm a real filmmaker here. Do you really want me to do this? I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. And he said, absolutely. That's why you're, you're here is because we do need people to be proud of, of their faith and to, to shout it off the rooftops and not be afraid to, to make a movie about the struggles of your faith and, and the spiritual warfare that's going on in this life. And, and I, too, you know, whether it's Cuba Gooding Jr. or, you know, Jennifer Garner or wh- whoever it is, so many, so many great actors, filmmakers are recognizing, OK, yeah, no, not only uh, can I express my faith through this, this is a viable genre. You know, it's 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 something where, you know, whether it's action or horror or drama, or whatever, faith has become its own genre yeah. that is actually doing well for a lot of companies. And therefore there's not only a spiritual task of like, yes, I want to express my faith through these, through these films and tell these kinds of stories, these uplifting, positive stories and characters, but also, okay, yeah, this is, this is working in a business sense. And so there's so many, it's really inspiring actually to see all these filmmakers and actors finally come around and be like, okay, okay, let's go make, <laughs> let's go make a faith movie. Let's not be afraid to do it. Let's go out there and let's tell these positive stories. <laughs> Mark, where can people go to watch this movie to, you know, is, is, is it the flat screen? Is it the big screen? Where is it at? So they can really experience this motion picture. Well, right now we just launched on video on demand. We had a great theatrical run for almost three weeks nice. in nationwide in five city in five states. Yeah, it was really fantastic back in at the end of June. And now we are launched on video on demand. So the main thing is go to Amazon, watch it on Amazon. You know it, you love it, rate it, review it, spread the word about Amazon. But we're across the platforms, digital and cable. So wherever you like to watch movies on your cable box, on your dish, if you go to Google, iTunes, uh, Apple Play, you know, um, uh, YouTube, Voodoo, tons and tons yeah. of platforms. So we're out there, look it up for profit, profit with a PH. But the main thing, go to Amazon and uh, and experience the prophecy. Well, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Arrow, thank you so much. I bless you. That's amazing. Well, you be brilliant today, okay, Mark? Right back at you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye.